Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we are returning to War in the Pacific Admirals Edition, our Let's Play series against Evoken. It is May 21st, 1942, and we finally got another turn in. It's been a little bit of a gap since my last one. I was on vacation for a week, uh, had some 4th of July and family stuff going on for a week, and so frankly I have not played War in the Pacific much as of late, but hoping to get back into this and get to be a more regular uh, cadence with these episodes. Uh, certainly not the longest gap in the series. Uh, with that being said, as I already said, it is the May 21st replay. We will be looking at the May 22nd orders phase, and I'm not really sure what to expect here. Uh, the Dutch East Indies has mostly fallen to the Japanese already, and now we're just kind of waiting to see where the next Japanese push is. Looks like the Japanese have been bombing Coast Coast Island with Betty's uh, and Nels out of uh, Sumatra. So I, I have been discussing possibly putting together a, a fighter force that could intercept them. I think it's out of range for any Japanese fighter escorts. They'd have to bring carriers in. So I think that would put a pretty quick end to any Japanese bombing raids there, at least for a time. Although we don't have any airfields there. We don't have a ton of engineers. We don't have a ton of supplies. And if they're going to keep bombarding us, it would probably take a little bit of time for us to be in a position where we could be... I think, ready to meet them. So it's unfortunate for the two battalions of infantry we have on Coast Coast because they're going to keep getting bombed by these Betty's and Nels. I suppose we could put a carrier offshore and fly cap off that and just sort of ambush them that way. That That's an option. It does involve deploying some carrier aircraft into a, an area where there's nowhere to retreat to if the Japanese sprint out with any heavy ships of their own. I don't know that it's terribly likely that the Japanese would come at us over there either, though, because there's just not, if anything happens to their ships, they're going to be screwed too. Um, so we'll have to think through that. Uh, that being said, we can see here they're bombing in the Philippines. I suppose the next thing could be if they decide to make an assault in the Philippines, our troops are starving there, things are not going well there. To be expected, you, you really can't, unless you're a wizard with the allied forces or the Japanese players completely incompetent. I don't think you can really hold the Philippines realistically um, in this game, uh, at least not without some sort of major modifications to the game. Um, so they're going to fall eventually. We put up a pretty good fight. I mean, it's almost June of 42 and the Philippines haven't fallen yet. So we're doing better. Uh, and Bataan hasn't fallen yet. So we're doing better uh, than uh, than the allies historically. I want to say a corregidor lasted longer but um when, when did corregidor surrender uh if i take a quick look here as we get torpedoed corregidor ended on may 6th so yeah uh, the japanese have been much slower than historical meanwhile we lost uh, it looks like an ak was torpedoed by a japanese submarine off rangoon and it was sunk. I'm not sure if that's one a full of supplies or if that was one that had already offloaded and was heading back. We'll have to take a look. Mo I want to say anybody within one day of Rangoon was already unloading. So they might might have been ships we were retiring. Not that like it doesn't matter, but I'm not, I don't really honestly, if we lose a couple of transports here and there, AKs, AKLs are not super valuable to us. Tankers are, but we've got plenty of cargo ships. This is the era of Le of the Liberty ship, remember? So we get a lot of AKs. Um, meanwhile, it looks like the Japanese launched another bombardment attack, so no attack in the Philippines yet. No major attack anyway. Uh, and the bombardment attack didn't really do anything. So just another day there under bombardment without anything really changing. Um, but yeah, I, I'm pretty shocked we're going to hold out. I don't know if we'll make it to June, but it'll be close. We're certainly at least two weeks past... Uh, the historical surrender. So uh, MacArthur sitting down there in Australia somewhere shouldn't be too angry at uh, at uh, his, uh, I forget his name. Oh my God. His uh, his subordinate who surrendered. And <laughs> I think he wanted to, I've, I've, I was watching the MacArthur movie. There was a movie called MacArthur. It was clearly like, hey, Patton was super successful. It was made in the 70s. Clearly it was like, hey, Patton was super successful. Let's make a film about MacArthur and do the same thing. Um didn't really work out that way, I don't think. Uh, but I was watching it the other day, and, and at least they dramatize up that uh, they wanted to nominate the, the commander who surrendered in the Philippines for Medal of Honor, and MacArthur didn't really want to. He was he was pretty opposed to it. Um, and I think that has its basis in reality. I'd have to go back and look. But I believe there was some 
some blood, some bad blood that stemmed from some of the things MacArthur sort of said offhandedly, probably not intending for them to be shared, but he was angry about what happened. And uh, that's kind of ironic because it was really MacArthur's fault that the Philippines went the direction they did. Uh, We might have lost a cargo ship with, I'm not sure if there's a way to see, but I think we did lose a cargo ship with supplies. That was what got torpedoed. Because these cargo ships all have a capacity of 2,900, which is pretty low. And I remember the convoy coming in had, I think, 23,000, and now it's 20,000. So we did lose a bit of cargo uh, there off of Rangoon. Looks like it was incoming supplies from Calcutta. So again, we've got about 20,000 supplies on their way into Rangoon. Um, Rangoon currently is 29,000, and there's a whole bunch more in Burma. We've been trying to bring supplies in. We had been flooding them in for a while, and then when the Japanese took Tavoy and uh, and started putting aircraft into Chiang Mai and we started seeing air combat over Rangoon. We kind of paused a lot of those large convoys that were coming in. But when we retook Mole Mine from the Japanese, we've started sending uh, some smaller convoys in to keep things flowing so we can continue building fortifications and airfields without uh, really digging into our supply capacity. I've been Upgrading the airfield at Rangoon pretty steadily. It's up to a level seven, which is the maximum size for the airfield there. We are trying to overstack it or overbuild it, if you will. Costs more supply, takes more time, but if we can get to a level eight airfield, that could be a great base for us to base bombers and other things out of. It'll also increase the aircraft stack limit, which right now is 350. We're not anywhere close to that. We're at about 135, but we do have aircraft that are back in India that could be surged forward. And I think more important is the base administration uh, supply of aircraft, which right now is limited to 11 groups. But if you upgrade the airfield to another size, I believe you get upgraded to 12 groups. And that shows how many squadrons can be doing different things during an, an individual day without penalties for like an airfield being too busy to support everything going on. Um, so we've got a lot of aircraft flying combat air patrol. Some of these guys are still gaining experience. You can see there's what four pilots here in green who all gained at least one experience last turn uh, just by flying combat air patrol. Uh, didn't increase any of their skills. They weren't training, but they did gain some experience for, for flying a combat air patrol. We did stand down the first AVG, which is our P-38 squadron. Um, these guys have a lot of aircraft that are down for maintenance. And so we decided, hey, let's get this squadron's maintenance and readiness levels back up above 20 ready aircraft. Right now it's 19 out of a possible 27. We have eight that are in various states of repair. Three more will be ready tomorrow, so we'll be back to 22 ready P-38s. Um, the rest of these guys are going to take like one to two weeks. The P-38 is a very temperamental aircraft. Doesn't make for the best aircraft to be used in the Pacific for that reason, although it was, I think, pretty common in the Pacific. Um, certainly, obviously, it was used to shoot down Yamato's uh, transports, but very temperamental aircraft, has a high service rating, requires a lot of maintenance, um, and so we'll cut the, the maintenance uh, down by about three next turn. We'll be back over 22. Uh, we also did, I want to say, upgrade one other aircraft squadron on one other squadron, the 49th Fighter Group, the 9th Fighter Squadron. This isn't a crack squadron by any means, but you can see they're back here in India, and we've, we are in the process of getting these guys up to 25 P-38s. Um, you can see here it's going to only take three days to get the entire squadron up and ready. Right now, three are ready. The bulk of the squadron will come in tomorrow, and then about another, what is that, like seven or eight aircraft will come in over the next two, two days after that. So in three days, we'll have a second fighter squadron flying uh, the P-38E. We only have a limited number of P-38Es that will be made available to us. It is only produced in the month of May, so as we are getting close to the end of May, that production will shut off, which means as we start to lose aircraft to accidents or combat, we will attrit ourselves, and we may have to switch these squadrons away from the P-38 to something else uh, to cannibalize and, and keep at least one squadron running the P-38 for some time. I picked the 49th Fighter Group not for any particular reason. Their experience level is fairly low. They're back in India training. That's fine. I can rotate pilots around as needed. They do have a, a sort of a cadre of really elite guys who we've added to the squadron of 70-plus uh, pilots uh, that we've pulled from the reserve that will all be there in one day. I don't think they're hitting the average experience yet because they haven't arrived yet. So in one day, those guys will be there, uh, which will probably bring us above 40 or, sorry, above 50 um, and then I'll probably release some of these less experienced pilots back to other units uh, so they can finish their training. And that'll instantly make the squadron much more deadly. 
Uh, but then also I didn't, you know, my other, the best squadrons I have right now are the AVG groups. These guys experience a 71, the other guys with the P-38s, best squadron probably in the entire uh, Army Air Force for us right now, the other guys flying the 38s. And then we've got the second and third AVG groups, both at 60 and 56 experience. Um, the 56 isn't that impressive, but the 60 is very solid for the second AVG. The problem is all the AVG groups have to be withdrawn by Independence Day of 1942. By the way, if you are from the U.S. and you celebrate Independence Day, happy belated uh, 4th of July a couple days ago. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, the squadron, the ball three, of these squadrons have to be withdrawn by July 4th. So it didn't make a lot of sense to spend a week getting one of these guys stood up. If in a month, they're all going to be stood down. So my thought was, let's get a different group up. Let's get them training. Let's get them experience. We'll rotate pilots and they will be our crack outfit. And then if we have to cannibalize any squadron because of casualties, it'll probably be the first AVG group because they're the most likely to be engaged in combat right now. Um, and then when we withdraw that fighter group, in July is where we're required to those aircraft will move to the pools so we could reallocate them to another squadron if we have enough, or we could uh, use them as reinforcements for the existing squadrons. A lot of talk about the 38, but I think it's important because they only made about two to 300 of the P 38 E's. Um, and then we don't get any more P 38s. I don't think until August is when sort of the more numerous variants start turning on permanently. Um, but we will have, the 27 in this group, we've got the 25 in the other group, so that's 52 ready aircraft, plus we've already got four in the pools here, um, and then we'll produce another, over the next week or so, we will produce another five to six aircraft. Uh, so all told, it'll be like 60, 62 to 65 P-38s that we'll have for, for up to two squadrons. Also, this is a larger squadron. The EVG groups, for some reason, have 27 base. The other fighter groups are 25, so... We could have 65 aircraft potentially to support 50 aircraft once these guys withdraw uh, to, for two squadrons worth. So we may be able to keep two squadrons active for a while. Depends on if anything really bad happens. There's a lot of talking about something that's really a sideshow in this. Um, anything else? So we've got the 20,000 supply coming in there. We've got 1,700 fuel going back to Colombo there. Uh, we've got another group of 8,300 on the way down from Rangoon from Calcutta. Two more AKs. Uh, we're loading up another cargo task force at Calcutta with three AKs. They'll be leaving with 9,000 supply probably tomorrow. Um, some supply coming in on some small cargo ships here uh, toward Rangoon. Uh, I mean, one thing we could possibly do is try and get some ASW work going on here in the Bay of Bengal and see where the Japanese submarines are that are torpedoing us. Or certainly start to give some of these convoys better escorts, but... I have a lot of cargo ships in the Indian Ocean. If that's if there's one thing I can afford to lose, it's a few cargo ships. So, and and I gotta think it's gonna be hard for Japan to operate a ton of subs this far north. If they drop a sub tender in Tavoy, they could do it. Uh, but it's and I guess Singapore is not that far off. But um, it's it's a question of where they're gonna deploy their assets. And if they start firing through a bunch of torpedoes. They don't have that many submarines. Meanwhile, 37,000 supplies here loading or unloading. They're loading in Cal Colombo, I think. Yeah, 37,000 is loading in Colombo. On how much tonnage? 35,000 tons? I guess we'll send these guys to Rangoon. So we told them to pull from the stocks here in Calcutta because we can bring in a bunch more supply or, or Sri Lanka because we can bring in a bunch more supplies there more easily. I don't see anything else really going on here in, in Burma. Very few fighters at Chiang Mai. No real change in the intel at Bangkok. No real change in anything that I can see in China here. Maybe a push toward isolating Quilin. There is one division moving west here between Lu Cho and Quilin. So the Japanese could try and put a wedge between Quilin and Lu Cho. Quilin is very much sort of the, the soft underbelly of our defenses here. We do not have much here. So that's something I may have to consider because we've only got two core there, about 300 assault value. We do have one portion of a core here with about 100 something assault value in the uh, open. What's the, what are they currently set to? They're set to combat. Um, does it tell me what they're... Which 
Trying to see. I don't think I can actually see how dug in they are. But that is a little bit worrying because the bulk of our forces over here to the east of Quilin, which is digging in in good defensive terrain, but the enemy could flank me and split our lines and isolate these guys up here, or at least force them to fall back to Quilin. Quilin has a good amount of troops in it. The question is, how many troops is he moving to split the gap? What's the uh, terrain there? It's a, it's wooded, so it's a times two defensive terrain. But anyone I move in there won't be dug in, so that's something to be worried about. We only have intel for one unit. It could be more. I don't know that he can... Well, actually, it's right on the roadway, so he could supply these guys pretty easily. Lucho has level three forts, almost to four. Quilin has level three, almost to four. Where's this cavalry corps going? How about we move these guys to Lucho? And then is anybody else moving here? Some of them are. Well, they're set to move, but they're not actually moving. We have quite a few artillery regiments here in Tuyan, which could be very useful, especially these anti-tank regiments, depending on where they're going to deploy their tanks. Just a, It's just a question of where it makes the most sense. But if he's going to flank me and come up these minor roads, then I may need to consider pulling these troops in this good defensive terrain back and make him go more toward and allow me to defend this terrain better. Because that is a that is a vulnerability there. Uh, let's pull the 88th core, which is pretty pretty good size. Strategically move them up to Lucho as well. And then we've got a couple of very good looking cores here at Chungking. At least in terms of assault value, less so in terms of support. I think these are some reconstituted units that don't have a lot of equipment yet. So they're a little bit soft. But if we did move the artillery forward here from Tuyan, that, that would be go a long way to helping them. Um, so we're moving the 88th Corps. 95th is broken up. Where's the rest of the 95th Corps? Yun and Kinko up here in the north, they're ways out. Hmm. Yeah, these are all very fragmented units. The seventy fourth is more fully fully formed. Let's form the 74th up. Pretty nice unit here, too. Through 500 and... What is it? 401 assault value with 234 disabled squads. This is a, this is a good unit. 12 anti-tank guns. 55 experience is pretty good for them, too. They're also sitting in a, in a nice hex from a supply point of view where they can let that stuff wash over them. I need to figure it out because I feel like things in China can go bad real fast if they get on these good roads and we don't have a strong defensive put up. But we're going to move the 5th Chinese Corps. That'll be 500 assault. We're going to move the 88th Corps. That'll be another 280 assault. So that's about 500 more. Put that into Lucho to add to the 340. And we'll have almost 1,000 there. And then we can also kind of decide what to do with the uh, troops here. 2,700 assault value is pretty damn good. But it's a question of do I want to abandon these good defensive positions? I kind of think I do. This is the first we've seen. I mean, it could be a feint to open things up, but I think actually I do need to move these guys. So we're going to move the 99th to Lucho. You know, we're just going to set all of this op mode and all to follow. So there goes a, a month of good digging in and open terrain. But... I think it's necessary. 
We'll pull them all back to here, at least notionally, and I'll decide if I, if we get here and they're not, they're just probing here and they're weak. We may deploy them into this ground here to dig in or drive them back. And if they're strong, then they may pull to one of the bases. The problem with the bases is you can use engineers to reduce fortifications uh, much more quickly. Open terrain, you can't do that. But if I'm not dug in an open terrain, it doesn't matter. I'd rather have the forts in a, in a base than nothing. Um, sending these guys out here to the Northeast to try and do some reconnaissance a bit supply situation in the Philippines, presumably pretty damn bad. It is second constabulary still got some supply. They're not too attrited out, but like some of these other guys here, the first Filipino division, half of it's disabled either from artillery or lack of supplies. Um, 21st is even more than half disabled or uh, or out of supplies. Fourth Marines are actually in pretty good shape. But yeah, not not a great situation there. We did have some subs that we're going to bring in like 100 supply, but that won't make a meaningful difference. It might get like a battalion up to strength. Uh, Bat Batavia fell. So nothing there. A couple of isolated units in Borneo. We still hold Mataram and I think... Sibogola, and those are the last holdouts in the Dutch East Indies. I guess kind of great Nicobar. How are the troops on uh, Coast Coast doing? 38 assault value on these guys. Oh, and uh, these guys are getting pretty bombarded. The tw second first pioneers, five of their 24 infantry sections are disabled from the aerial bombardment. We don't really have anything we can shoot at the, at the high-level bombers. What do we have coming from the east? Do we have any? I think we have the Hermes coming, and we've got 20 Wildcats on here. These guys are carrier capable but not trained, so it would be sending a lot of pilots to their death to try and operate off of the base, but we could try it. They're going to be on map in five days. Alternatively, we could send some carriers south from Bombay, but that probably isn't wise. That's a long voyage. We've got two American carriers at uh, Colombo. The Lexington and the Saratoga are both 23 days away from getting out of the refits. Prince of Wales is on the way to England or Great Britain. 65 days away still. So she can finish her repairs out that way. No real shipping in and around Perth right now. Or Newcastle for that matter. We are sending some troops to Vatavupu, the Conga base force. Possibly to take one of these bases away from the Japanese. We'll see. Um, these tankers, I think, finished unloading at Suva. So we've got some fuel at Suva. We've got some fuel at Vavu. And we've got some fuel at Pago Pago. So we can support some naval assets out of the Fiji group now, thankfully. These guys are returning to Pearl and doing so in a somewhat foolish manner of going pretty close to Canton, but it'll give us a good sense of if the Japanese have any actual recon there. So far, it doesn't appear to be so, although we have some cloud cover to hide behind. Um, Tennessee's 11 days till, what, her system damage is repaired? She's still got all that float damage. Hornet has a refit coming in a, a, over a month, so nothing to wait on. We got the six Marines on their way to Pearl. We have some a Rocky Mountain. Is that a Canadian Infantry Battalion? Rocky Mountain. Ra yeah, it is. 
Ha ha! <laughs> We're sending some Canadians to uh, Savi, as well as some engineers and American infantry to replace the Marines that landed there. And then two more battleships are on their way to Pearl Harbor, the Maryland and the Arizona, both repaired from their Pearl Harbor damage. Okay. So, yeah, not a lot else to show off this turn, I don't think. Um, we've been flying recon over some of these islands here in the south. No real update on enemy forces in the area. We are going to try and sneak 29,000 supplies to Pago Pago from Australia. Why are you going that way? That mission routing for the CS task force is very foolish. We're going to go right by New Caledonia. I guess we'll find out if the Japanese have any bombers there. We could redirect them. Uh, if we take a look at the uh, Intel screen, no air losses for either side today. Interesting. Cargo ship ready tomorrow, the John Hart. Four more days for La Pampa. couple of best boats in about 10 days. And the Wasp in 19 days. So that'll be nice to have the Wasp. That'll, we'll quickly rush her into Pearl. We'll have two carriers of Pearl then. But yeah, that's the situation right now in our War in the Pacific game. Is there anything else worth looking at? Top pilots, I don't think anything changed. No one got killed or wounded. Ship sunk. Just the uh, AK. Five victory points, Australian. She was 2,900. Yeah, she was definitely in that one convoy. 2,700 tons. Well, what about our subs? Who's who's doing what here off the Japanese coast? 26 out of 26, 22 out of 30, 30 out of 30. Silver sides might need to head home. Was the silver sides, is that the one that was the renamed sub that, that sank before the war started and I think like 22 crew members were killed? And then... 33 were rescued, like one of the few times any subs have been rescued where they actually sank uncontrolled to the bottom and, and uh, a rescue bell was sent down to the sub, I think. I want to say, was it Silver Sides? I think it might have been. She only has 10 torpedoes. I don't know how long Thresher's been here, but if she hadn't fired a torpedo yet, let's... Give her a patrol zone down here. Okay. Down by where Silver Sides is. Oh, by the way, how are the, um, how are the subs that were running into the mines in Singapore doing? Singapore still says it has 200 and some odd ships. All right, so Seawolf is 52 system damage, 48 float. She's still alive. She's still making five knots on her way back to Rangoon. We may send her back to Colombo instead for repairs. As of right now, I would think she will make it. Um, Finback also struck a mine at Singapore on the way to Colombo. She's in much better shape. She should make it. She's still making 12 knots. Okay. 
Yeah. So anyway, guys, I think that's going to do it for today's episode. I will uh, keep you guys posted as things continue to unfold in this game. This is War in the Pacific, Admiral's Edition. Uh, And as always, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you very much for watching. And until next time, I'm out.